So today I'm going to tell you a story about what's been happening uh, in California related to solar power development. And just in case it gets lost anywhere, and I don't want to, I want to make sure that the, the main point holds through the talk, so I'll start off with it, which is that we want more solar power. Unquestionably, we need more solar power, but we need to be responsible about where we put it. You can't just put it everywhere. We can't say, oh, put it out in the Mojave Desert where we put all of our landfills and where we put all, get all oil gas from and where we do all our other kinds of um, extractive things because these are places that also have crises facing them. Right? You got a climate crisis at the same time as a biodiversity crisis and we should be looking toward solutions that work to achieving solutions for both, not ones that just push issues onto the other. Right? We can't, we can get, we paved the whole Mojave Desert in solar panels, but do we want to lose a desert tortoise? Do we want to lose certain uh, endangered species that we spend, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars trying to conserve? That, that's something that we are going to have to grapple with as we de deploy this stuff, because the, the big transition that we're going under right now from energy is we're moving from subterranean fossil fuels, which are very, very energy dense, but mostly underground. Right? You just see a little well pad and it just pulls gas out of the ground or oil from a, a, a platform. Um, renewables on the surface of the earth are very diffuse, which means you need a lot of them. You're going to have to cover a lot of stuff. So the nice thing, again, about solar power is it's the one energy technology you can live under. Right? So it's the one t so, uh, energy technology that we have the option of co-siting power generation on top of already built human infrastructure. And that's the, the way we, we need, that, that's kind of the, the upshot that I'll eventually get through after telling you some missteps that have happened in California and across the American West in the last decade. So, here we go. A lot of the, the framing for this research is what I call, or the, the, the literature calls, I, I actually didn't coin this, the social gap in renewable energy. And the social gap is, if I were to poll all of you, if you like solar panels or if you like wind power, no matter if you're Republican or Democrat, most of you would say yes. You know, it turns out at the local level, renewable energy is a very bipartisan issue. And most solar, uh, utility scale solar before the last election was cited in Republican congressional districts in California. In the United States, most wind power is cited in Republican congressional districts. So these are things that you know, are bipartisan when they hit the ground, but there still is opposition. So the, the social gap is between, all, it, let's say 95% of you supported renewables in this room. If I were to start showing you particular projects, you might start finding projects you didn't like. And that's the gap. The social gap is the distance between those who support renewable energy generally and those who uh, are resisting local particular projects. Now, you might be familiar with the most common of these explanations, which is NIMBYism. Right? But the social science research says that NIMBYism is actually not a very effective way to explain these things. Of course, there are some people who don't want things in their backyard. That's what NIMBY stands for, not in my backyard. But there's often other reasons that people don't like projects. They weren't invited to participate in the conversation. Now, actually, there was one guy I interviewed um, who learned about a 5,000 acre solar farm in a rural area across the street from his house from the solar installer who was putting solar panels on, on his roof. And he's like, oh, I was never told about that. And then he got the, the note the next. So there's this, uh, you know, this idea, it's called the democratic deficit hypothesis, which is that people aren't actually invited to participate in the, in the decision, so they're more likely to be resistant to the project. Whereas if you got local participation in early, you might be able to think about issues that might come up in, in the siting of that project. Um, we have a tendency, you know, no matter what we build in this country, to uh, take this approach, which is decide what the project is behind closed doors, right, don't invite the community in, announce the project to the community, and then defend the project, as opposed to a more participatory approach where you basically invite people in and, and get the community to participate in, in the design of the project, perhaps, um, or at least get their uh, opinions on it. So there are other, the, the other major hypothesis here is called the qualified support hypothesis. This means that 
yeah, I like solar panels as long as they don't wreck biodiversity. That's an example of qualified support hypothesis. So it's your, your values and beliefs. Yes? Hold on a second. Oh. No one talks unless they have a mic. Oh, there we go. The rules. Can we also hold questions till the end instead of interrupting the speaker? Yes. Do you prefer that? Or? Doesn't matter to me. Let's take this one and then we'll, okay. we'll, we'll go with that maybe for the, for the next path. What about the expense of, of uh, your power bill? It, in terms of opposition to renewables, that could be a reason that people are opposed to it if it causes uh, power bills to go up. That's certainly um, in this, but it's usually not something that on the, on the ground when a project's being proposed that that comes in. It's usually some of these other factors that people are finding. Anyhow, there's a whole bunch of other things that people have uh, found in this, and they're all nuanced, and they're all specific to particular regions, um, particular communities, and, and they're, in some cases, a familiarity with projects, right? If you already have a lot of wind farms in your community, more wind farms really aren't going to cause much trouble because the community's already been dealing with them and probably is familiar with them. Um, so, um, in terms of the, the projects that I'll be talking about today, we're talking about utility scale projects that are very, very large. Um, one project that I can, I think the, the largest project that I can think of in California has 9 million solar panels in it. That's a lot of solar panels. You, if you, it's about nine square miles. That would take you all day to walk around. And you better bring a lot of water because it's hot and dry in the desert where that one is. Um, so these are very, very, so they're not what you're typically seeing in and around this area. The closest big, big project you'd see out here is out probably in Pinoch Valley. Um, there's some out in the Central Valley. How many people have seen a, a utility scale solar project? Like a really big one. Okay, so some of you have seen them. I'll show you some pictures of them. Um, there are some issues with the projects themselves. And, and again, when I put up pictures of, the, of challenges with solar projects, I'm not trying to compare them with natural gas or other technologies. I'm just trying to compare them with other solar projects in, in, the, in, the, in the, the spirit of making things better, not opposing technologies or, or picking sides here. Um, the, the biggest impacts in California to wildlife, um, the species probably most impacted by solar projects is, is the, the desert tortoise that I mentioned earlier. Now, you might not know this, but American taxpayers spend more money on conserving desert tortoise than the gray wolf, grizzly bear, and bald eagle combined. It's pretty impressive. It's partly because there's a lot of land involved with this. The other thing that's neat to know about the desert tortoise is most of them occur on public lands managed by either the Park Service or the Bureau of Land Management. So in some ways, the federal government has a special responsibility to protect the species because they basically are managing all their lands and most of their habitat. Now, there's a bunch of challenges with this. Um, when you cite a project, a nine, let's, let's take the example, a nine square mile project, you've got to survey those nine square miles for tortoises. And if you find them, you've got to pick them up, you've got to attach these little GPS collars, and you've got to move them off site. That's called translocation. And they do not do very well. Very high rates of mortality. These species can live, individual animals can live 90, 90 years. So you can imagine they're living 80 years in a certain spot. You pick them up and put them in another canyon, they're not going to know where they are, right? Or they're going to be predated by something else. Um, this, so big, that's probably the big issue. We've had some projects that have had to move about 200, 250 desert tortoises from, to another location. I have a couple tables. I don't have them in here, but um, in another paper where we document probably about 40 projects that have had to move desert tortoise in, in one way or another. Now, that goes right to the cost question because I've want, there's one project, it's a separate project than what I've talked about. It's a, a power tower. This takes mirrors and shines light to a central boiler to make steam. Um, that project, I think they spent $60 million on a conservation strategy for the desert tortoise. And guess what? That's all in your PG&E bill, that, that, that conservation. Cause that gets rolled into that cost. So, we want to avoid landscapes with desert tortoise for that reason, because we have a special responsibility to protect them. Um, also, they're very costly to move, and they don't really respond very well. So there's kind of ethical questions there. This is a pic picture of a San Joaquin kit fox. Actually, I'm sorry, this is a Mojave Desert kit fox. There's, there's two species that come up in the solar story here. The, uh, 
the San Joaquin kit fox mainly lives along the Central Coast Range, and the Mojave obviously lives out in the Mojave Desert. When you find the other kind of animal that lives in burrows, in, oh, the hard thing about counting tortoise, by the way, 90% of the time they spend underground. So, so send biologists out there, and when you when you speak, say you have to do your surveys in a month, you know the odds of you finding those tortoises are very low. So that project I mentioned earlier that cost $60 million for their conservation, their initial surveys only found seven tortoises. And when they actually started clearing the land, they had to go back and get a new biological opinion from the Fish and Wildlife Service because they started finding dozens and dozens and dozens. They ended up finding about 150 of them. Um, so this is a, 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 sorry for the dead animal, but that is a kit fox that was uh, killed by distemper. And the other animal that they want to evict out of solar projects is the kit fox. And the way they do that was, was, is with coyote urine in this case. They'll spray coyote urine on the, the burrow hole. And that is supposed to keep the, the kit foxes away because they think there's a coyote in and around. That's, that who, that's who eats these guys. Um, and for the first time in that, that's been recorded, they transferred distemper to the kit fox population through coyote urine, you know, distemper, that shot that you might get for your dog. So, so these are, again, things that people made mistakes about, things that could be easily corrected, but, you know, these are wild. This is where we're talking about the green civil war, right? It's another endangered species that we're talking about. This here, you're seeing damage from heat generated from those solar power towers I mentioned earlier. So solar power towers, as opposed to photovoltaics, which mainly is what I'll be talking about today, um, solar power towers create heat with those mirrors, you know, hundreds of thousands of mirrors focusing on, powered by Google, by the way, those mirrors, they're all, that was Google's technology behind that, um, shining this light on this tower. Now, when they want to back off the power, they, they take the heat, they focus the mirrors a little higher in the sky off the boiler, and that creates a little halo, and fish and, yeah, oh boy, I heard it, uh, fish and wildlife has a new word. It's called a streamer. And a streamer is a bird that flies through that heat flux and disappears, like a meteor. It just burns through. Um, we have that solar power tower that I told you cost $60 million on desert tortoise. I think last year they documented about 1,500 bird deaths what on that project. At the tower? That's not completely clear, but somewhere around 2,500 degrees. It's really hot. Yes, do you know? Oh. The question was how hot was the, the, the solar flux? And that's in the, it's in the 2000s, about 2,500 degrees, I, I think. But don't quote me on the specific temperature, but somewhere around there. So very, very hot. C or F? C or F? Degree C or C? C. Let's do that. Okay, no more interrupting me. <laughs> <laughs> you can throw everything. Write, write your notes. Take, take notes and ask questions at the end. So what you're seeing here, that those temperatures are far high enough to melt the carrion of that holds the feathers together. So you're seeing damage. This is a bird that didn't become a streamer, but was definitely mortally injured. And that's a, we don't even have a very good sense for how many birds are dying because when birds fall out of the sky in the desert, that's like a free lunch for for any animal. So they get scavenged right away. So it's actually very hard to count these things. That's something we're trying to study where we put in some grant proposals to put camera traps so we can understand what's going on in that case. There's actually a lot of collisions as well. So the other bird issue, um, there's something that's attracting aquatic birds in the Mojave Desert to solar power plants. And some people are proposing a lake effect. My colleague at Purdue who studies bird vision says that's, that's your brain thinking it looks like a lake because we actually don't know what birds see. We actually have no science on what, how fast, on what birds' vision looks like. They see in the infrared in some cases. They process images faster. They see different contrasts. So we're calling it a lake effect, but there's actually other things that could be confounding here that we need to examine a little more closely. But you can kind of see from far away it does, at least to our eyes, look like a lake in some cases. And guess what? If you're a bird, aquatic bird, flying in the desert and you see a lake way out in the distance, I'm headed there, right? Because that's where you know, birds sometimes see polarized light. That's another hypothesis we have is polarized light. There's not much of it in nature except for lakes, and solar panels are the other one. This is a study in conservation biology about 10 years ago 
that found aquatic insects prefer to lay their eggs on solar panels than in water. Not a viable reproductive strategy. Here's the project I mentioned earlier. It's about 9 million solar panels. It's called the Desert Sunlight Project. In the background, you're seeing Joshua Tree National Park. They were not very happy about this project because one of the things the Park Service is supposed to do is protect view sheds and things like that. So they had a bunch of negative comments. There were you know, a few dozen tortoises on this, on this particular site. Um, but you can see it's a very empty space. So you can see why people might be opposed to giant industrial kind of infrastructure going into a place like that. This is a similar size project. This one's down. Oh, this project is in Desert Center, California, in between Blythe and Palm Springs on that route. What's the power loss going from the desert to LA? We'll come back. We'll come back. Hold on. Hang, hang tight. So this here is on the Carrizo Plain. Anybody been down the Carrizo Plain National Monument? This is down in San Luis Obispo County. Um, now, the, the challenge, again, with land use change and solar projects is the, the p common practice right now is to scrape these sites. They literally show up with these big um, pieces of caterpillar equipment that have the, the, the blade on, under the center. They get wheels on both sides and they will send six or seven of them. You can see they're in the act of scraping. This is desert sunlight when it was being developed. You can see very intensive terraforming, right? Because if you see th in these pictures, you know, water moves through these landscapes. You can kind of see how water moves through them. And when you, when you really terraform that, it really transforms that landscape. They get rid of the burrows. They get rid of the old growth back barrel cactus, all the stuff that you see. This is one project that didn't have that same level of land use change. They just built roads, and then they went in and drove posts every you know, few feet to put for the heliosets. This was for a solar power tower. But this is the, one of the greatest forms of land. So for many, many years, housing has been the greatest form of land use change in California. Solar panels are right up there now because we are tra rapidly transforming. Um, this is the Western Antelope Valley. Anybody ever been out to the California Poppy Reserve? I took this picture out there. So you can see the solar farms out in the distance there. This is the Poppy Reserve here in orange and yellow, all those beautiful colors. Look at all the solar farms there, there, there. There, there, and if we zoomed out, we'd see even more. So the western Mojave Desert, which has already been somewhat, it's not as pristine as the eastern Mojave Desert, which has a lot more kind of ecosystem integrity. There's a bunch of old farming activity that took place in the western um, edge, is rapidly becoming just a, an industrial zone for solar production. And that's transforming that landscape for, for better or for worse. I mean, that, that's, that's the question we have to ask ourselves. This is the power tower I mentioned earlier. The project is called the Ivanpah Solar Electric Generating Station. That is the one I mentioned that cost $60 million in desert tortoise. Um, and you can see that's the heat flux. And when you see this in person, the glowing is very, very strange. It, doesn't, it looks like one of those LED lights that, that kind of glow funny. So it doesn't really capture well. Um, and that's, so that heat flux I mentioned that was killing the birds is, occurs up here when they, when they redirect all those mirrors to shine up higher. And there's our star of the show again, the desert tortoise. He's outfitted with his little GPS transponder because they got to track him and make sure that he doesn't die, and, and many of them do, unfortunately. And then here are some kit foxes playing. These are San Joaquin kit foxes. This is an endangered species in California. There are only three core recovery areas um, for, their, for that species because they've mainly been extirpated from the Central Valley. Now they're kind of in, in some valleys that are in the coast range. Smallest mammal, pretty cool animal. Um, the other big animal that finds wildlife conflict out in the desert region is bighorn sheep. So bighorn sheep, they like to be in their mountains, and then they like to come down into the, the plains in between, or the basin and range, depending on what part of the, the, the area you're in. And the more and more we develop the, the low-lying areas, the more they stay in their little pockets in the mountain areas, and the more likely they are to genetically inbreed. So they suffer from inbreeding depression when their populations get isolated, and developing nine square mile solar projects in random places blocks their ability to move across landscapes and could kind of make that problem even worse. 
So you may have heard of these two biologists, famous biologists, E.O. Wilson and Thomas Lovejoy. They wrote an op-ed in the New York Times against a project called the Sol Soda Mountain Solar Project that was going to be selling electricity to the Department of Power and Water of Los Angeles. And that op-ed and a b bunch of activism in that community got that got Department of uh, LA Department of Water and Power to, to terminate the contract. So that project's not being built. So that was a good news story. You can see if you're ever driving toward Baker, California, on that pass before Baker, um, that's actually Soda Mountain there. One of the groups actually that was also opposed to this was part of the Cal State system, which I am part of, because right in the water, right below this, in the same watershed, is a research station that called Zizex. That um, if you ever driven across the Mojave Desert, see the sign for Zizex. That's our little research station out there, and they thought that it was going to affect water flows because, as you see. They terraform things, and that could have negative consequences. And then lastly, the species I'll talk about that has um, been raising. So many of the early projects were being cited in the eastern Mojave and western Mojave deserts. A lot of them were on public lands. Um, more recently, we've seen the shift to, to the Central Valley. So more solar projects are being cited in the Central Valley. And what ha that has meant is a lot of farmland is being converted. And the Farm Bureau doesn't want any of their prime farmland converted at all. They don't want to lose the political power that's associated with being a big agricultural state. Um, there's also wildlife that lives in these, particularly in the, the, the lands that aren't farmed every year. It's like the marginal farmland. So um, this is uh, Swainson's hawk. Swainson's hawk is an amazing bird that flies all the way to South America, goes down to the Pampas in Argentina, and comes back to the Central Valley every year. Goes right through, all the way through Mexico, amazing. Guatemala goes through a whole, the whole region. It's an amazing migration that it does. It's here now. It's, this is the time of year it's up in the Central Valley, around Davis and things. And you're seeing you know, where it, its occurrences uh, have been documented in the last you know, decade or so. Um, or that was just for one year, I'm sorry. Uh, this case, so one solar project, often when you build a project you have to mitigate your impacts. That means you have to go acquire land to, to make up for the land that you've developed. And the concern with Swainson's Hawk is one, we had a project that was developed and they got, I think, what's this say here? How much money was it? Millions? Three million dollars were set, were putting money, was money that was supposed to be set to, to purchase Swainson's Hawk habitat and Kern County just rolled it into their general fund. Ah, so, <laughs> there you go. Yeah, Kern County, that's where they burn the Steinbeck books. But um, So anyhow, this is um, the Swainson's Hawk, amazing bird, another bird that comes into conflict with, and not because of collisions, but because of um, issues with foraging habitat. Like they want to make this, you want to make dry farming lands available for these, for, they, for their hunting and such. So that's, and we're going to continue to see Swainson's Hawk because we're going to continue to see more projects built in the Central Valley. That's my hope. And the, good, the more good story here is that we're not seeing the same endangered species impacts we've seen in the last five, year, in the last five years that we saw in the first you know, five years of development after maybe 19 or 20, 2010 or so. So we're starting to see a shift toward more agricultural areas. That's good news, but there are still species to be considered there. This is the Silorian Valley. This is also this is in between Mojave Preserve and, the, and um, Death Valley National Park. And it was a site for a, a project. Uh, this is actually going to be a wind and a solar project. I think it was going to be 10,000 acres. Um, this project was also was not built. But the, the, the main concern there wasn't necessarily habitat, but the rural character that, you know, there's famous trails that moved there, Spanish Trail and such, um, that were sought to be protected. And then finally, the other major issue we have out there is a lot of cultural resources and a lot of land that's sacred to Native Americans out in this region. This is the, um, which project was this? This is Blythe. This is the Blythe Solar Project. Um, intaglios are these stick figures that you could see from airplanes. They didn't actually know they were out there until we started flying around in airplanes and started seeing stick figures laid out in the, what they call desert pavement, which is the kind of this rock surface that kind of laid um, into the soil. And you can see here, this is the Blythe Solar Project. There was a geoglyph here and they damaged it when they built a road to the solar project there. So, 
Um, I actually, when I was visiting this site, a gentleman um, named Alfredo Figueroa took me up to, he's like a historian, native elder, he took me up to a little hilltop and he pointed into the next valley over. He said, there's a project over there called the Genesis Project. And when they start digging that, they're going to find my, my ancestors' remains because we occupied every little watering, there's a watering hole in that project, and we, we had paths that went by every watering hole from the Colorado River to the Pacific Ocean. Lo and behold, that project got a bunch of federal funding and it got federally approved on BLM lands. They start digging and they find cremation site right away. Like they had to block off. Now it's blocked off in, in the solar project. But anyhow, these are um, challenges that are not going to go away because there's lots of land out there that's sacred to Native Americans and, and working with the tribes to figure out where to site projects is, is going to be a major task for um, public lands managers and, and folks working in this space. The other thing people don't realize is solar projects require a lot of water. Now, they don't compare, they don't require anywhere near as much water as natural gas requires to make a kilowatt hour of electricity compared to solar. So just make sure that that's the key point. But natural gas power plants also are not in the Mojave Desert. There are some, right, but not all of them. And, and the, the challenge is that a lot of these solar projects are relying on groundwater in desert regions, and that's often fossil groundwater, meaning it was water that was from a previous time that, if you extract it, doesn't get replaced at the rate at which you're extracting it. And that's something we want to avoid. We now have um, a Sustainable Groundwater Management Act in California in the last couple years that is going to hit the solar industry when they start to try to put projects out in areas that are in impacted uh, watersheds or um, water tables. So. Um, anyhow, this is showing you a couple of different solar projects and how many acre feet of water they use. It's not really in context, but you can see these are all projects that are built. These have all been built. These projects have all been built, yep. And one of the things you see here, so where do they use the water? One thing you can see, the gray is construction and the white is operation. So most of the water is being used during construction. And why is the water being used for construction? Because they scrape the land and it creates so much dust, they have to spray water to comply with the Clean Air Act. There, there was one case in Antelope Valley that actually became a nuisance because of dust and the city stopped construction, made them stop construction. It put their federal loans at risk, actually. A couple hundred million dollars were at risk. Um, you could see what happens is that the solar panels get covered in dust. right? So when they're operating, you also want to wash them. Because you got, I mean, you're losing power if you're covering them with dust. But you're, you're not getting the amount of electricity you can. This, as I mentioned, is your nearest um, solar farm. This is out in Panoch Valley. If you've ever been out there, it's a really beautiful area. Um, big, not agricultural in the sense that it's growing crops, but a lot of ranching land and stuff like that. That was also habitat that was put at risk from this solar project. Now, there are other parts of the solar story that are associated with this as well. Um, we have rare metals. We have mining activities associated with these rare metals. Right, this is the Mountain Pass mine. This is a rare earth element. Now, there's no rare earths in solar panels, but there are in other uh, renewable technologies. This is actually right upstream from that Ivanpah solar project I mentioned earlier. This is, by the way, where 100% <clears throat> of the rare earths were produced up through the 1960s or 70s. And rare earths were initially used from this mine right here, oh, okay, yeah. the Mountain Pass mine. And now most rare earths are made in China or, or and processed Chinese, in Malaysia. The Chinese get this. They bought this mine through Canada. And federal regulations don't allow them to do that directly, right? So they bought a company in Canada, which then... Okay. Nope. Yeah, there we go. important point because this is a strategic national security issue. You know what, by the way, do you know what rare earths were used mainly for in the 1950s, 60s, 70s? Colored televisions. So there you go. Lithium, another major impact area that we're going to start seeing more of. Um, this is Nevada. 13,000 active placer mines uh, permits for lithium extraction. So um, those are just some other. This is a solar project that's being pro proposed right now, Yellow Pine Solar Project that's going to be um, Nevada is a whole nother level. I mean, we're talking about California. At least California has been correcting some of the ecological 
challenges are responding to them. Um, Nevada, not so much. And by the way, this is, uh, this is South America, so I'm skipping a little bit here. But this is uh, what those brine systems look like. So the way that you, ex you can either hard rock mine for lithium, like they do in Australia, or like in South America, they actually will bring brines up. If you look, if you squint, you can see all little well holes throughout here. That's what they, they drill, and then they, they pump the water into these evaporation ponds. That's how they get the lithium carbonates out. So these are just other pressures that are going to accompany because at, if we're going to go to solar, we've got to store that energy somehow. So thinking about how to couple that with batteries also means thinking about the implications of coupling those with batteries. Like what are those supply chain impacts and such. Um, jobs, 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 jobs. So we could talk about this all the time. But, um, so this is just to point out that this is going to continue to happen, right? We have a lot of solar um, jobs already, and we'll continue to have them. One out of every 50 new jobs created nationally are in this industry. So this is um, a very good growth area. One point that I want to make out here, so this is a, a way to think about jobs, is how many jobs do you create per megawatt of solar installed? All right, megawatts about enough to power a thousand homes or so. And you can see if you, you're doing these big, big solar projects, it's about 2.2 per megawatt, and if you're doing more distributed projects, you see it's a little more than double um, the jobs. So if we're looking for kind of continuing to grow jobs more, you want to go with more distributed residential solar behind the meter stuff than utility scale. There's just not a ton of jobs that are created from it. I'm going to skip this slide. This is just talking about what our challenge is for um, finding the right people with the training to do these things. So one of the other challenges is that when they go out into certain rural areas, they don't have the workforce that they need to develop those projects effectively. So back to the dust. Um, this is valley fever. Valley fever is an illness that's been sweeping through California. You know, it comes in periodic waves. We're having another wave of it now. Um, the Centers for Disease Control has, has, has a few case reports where they are finding outbreaks of valley fever among construction workers at solar utility scale solar projects. So just like we have environmental justice issues with people working in the fossil fuel industries, you can kind of see some environmental justice issues working on these solar fields. Again, I think you know, their conclusions, as much as this would be, is avoidable, I think, with better land use, thinking about keeping soils intact, not scraping the land. Um, also, I think they point out that people weren't even wearing basic mouth or uh, face equipment and stuff to protect themselves from the dust. So that's a challenge that we're going to continue to see. Now, we have a term that we're borrowing from another scholar that uh, is called techno-ecological synergies. And we just have a paper coming out in, actually this month in July, I don't think it's out yet, um, in Nature Sustainability, which is a journal of the nature family where we look at, you know, we as a big team of people from UC Davis and uh, National Renewable Energy Labs and UC Berkeley, um, we're looking at where, this question I, I started with us with was where can we actually put solar and integrate it into already developed and built infrastructure so we don't see the wildlife impacts or the environmental justice impacts. Um, and we look at a lot of different things in that paper. I'll, I'll go through a couple of them here. But the idea is like thinking about how, instead of our technological infrastructure is always being a place where you, you lose ecosystem services or you've disrupted ecosystem services, how can you actually think about building solar farms in ways that enhance ecosystem services in a way? Instead of having negative impacts, these actually have positive impacts. What, what are the win-win scenarios that we can go after here? Um, and these are just a couple things to start us off. One, California. Um, actually, the Environmental Protection Agency tracks throughout the country, not just in California, what they call Repowering America's Lands, in what's called Repowering America's Lands program. Um, and what they do is they look for abandoned mines. And they, first of all, they screen for solar, so it's got to be flat, it's got to be sunny, it's got to be relatively close to transmission. So they'll screen for um, brownfields, abandoned landfills, because you can't put on an active landfill until it settles, because there's a geometry problem there um, as that thing settles. Uh, Superfund sites, right? Silicon Valley is the largest concentration of Superfund sites in the country, toxic sites that are contaminated. 
Um, Recrocytes are similar to that. And they found about 1.7 million acres. How would that compare to covering all the parking lots in town? We don't have the answer to that. And the shopping malls themselves. It's a good question. I'll come back to that question. Let's, I'm going to talk about the parking lots in a second. So 1.7 million acres that are in California would be enough to provide about 500 gigawatts of power. California's peak, somewhere around 40 gigawatts on a given day. So we certain, so the next time someone says you have to choose the desert tortoise or climate change, tell them, no, no, we actually have plenty of places to put solar in responsible ways that don't disrupt ecosystem services, don't have impacts on biology. Um, your, the, the question was asked about parking lot space, and we haven't measured that yet, but some other folks have looked at that question. And here's my pitch for the parking lots, because this, this is 500 gigawatts, not even including rooftops or parking lots. Right, you start adding that, and now we're really talking about a, a full picture here. Um, one of our major concerns is heating up cities, right, with global warming. Cities are going to get hot. People are going to have more heat stroke. Um, if you, there's been some science that shows if you put solar panels over parking lots, you can reduce the heat island effect, right? Because you, if you think about it, you, the, the thermal absorption, isn't, it's not there to radiate out all night. Those panels will cool off pretty quickly, and the parking lot will be shaded, whereas that pavement, you know, stays pretty warm all night. Um, not to mention, how about getting into a nice cool car, right? If we're, like heat stroke, that, one of the places that heat stroke occurs is when people get in a hot car. Right, and if you had more shade, I mean, you go out to a desert area, and it's just, I mean, the funny part, I would go out to this Ivanpah project so many times for my project, um, and there's this little town next door, and it's got all these arrows everywhere. It says, shade parking this way. And you drive through this gigantic parking lot to find, like, five car par parking spots. Meanwhile, this giant solar farm's right over the, the fence. Um, you can think about better ways to design that whole thing. That also eliminates transporting the power if you got it right there. I think the point is made that more distributed it has impacts on, on transmission losses, which you can have it more direct. Not to mention, we're going to all be driving electric cars 20 years from now. Everybody's going to have an electric car. Most people. And having that infrastructure directly tied to charging cars, that's, even more, that's fewer losses, fewer bottlenecks in the system. So there's a lot of opportunity here. We just need to think about it more carefully and provide the incentives to make, you know, this stuff's more expensive. Putting this over solar in a parking lot's more expensive than bulldozing and scraping a big piece of land. Yes? I want to ask you, right now, we have about 15 more minutes okay. to talk and, and answer questions. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask you about the I've got four more slides. <laughs> They're pictures. This is uh, one that we explore in this Nature Sustainability paper on uh, techno-ecological synergies, agrivoltaics. So we have a lot of agricultural crops that don't need as much sun as California provides. Right, it's a very sunny state. We can grow some pretty good stuff here, but leafy greens and things like that, they don't need as much sun as, if anybody's a gardener, you don't need as much sun as you, as you do for tomatoes and stuff like that. So um, there's a lot of opportunities, and people are designing solar that's over, in this case, greenhouses. Right, so in here you're producing, you know, often greenhouses are sources of power consumption. Right, you have to power greenhouses externally. If you can start powering them and making them able to export power to the grid, that would also be good. You can see here they have a solar farm that fits a tractor underneath it. And here you can see some grazing. I'm not sure I would, I wouldn't use goats. I think they'll eat the wires. Maybe, maybe sheep are okay. A project that we've been trying to get some funding for, we haven't hit the right um, proposal yet, but we're partnering with a, a, uh, an organization that takes care of bees and want to install apiaries and restore, put hedgerows and native plants around the solar farm to improve the pollination services. Um, you have a lot of crops in the Central Valley that are critically dependent on pollination services. Almonds, for example, every single one needs a pollinator. And farmers aren't very happy about solar farms coming in, clearing the property, putting up a chain link fence and becoming a source of dust on their plants. Right, so if you can enhance the ecosystem, put the hedgerows in the block, the dust, put the apiaries in there to make it more economic for the landowner, now you have a, a better situation for everybody. And then here's just a couple more. These are the agrivoltaics again. This is actually solar honey. You know, somebody's marketing 
their honey, because it's coming from a solar farm, with that label on there. Um, this is a canal in India. I hear someone mention in India. Yeah, they're covering the canals in India with solar panels. I asked the Department of Water and Power. I'm sorry, the Department of Water in California. I was like, why, you guys don't, why don't you do that? And they're like, oh, we're afraid of workers falling in. <laughs> I, I think that was the worst excuse I've ever heard for uh, staying out of these. Every semester, my um, sustainable energy strategy students, um, they model what, how much power potential could be, used, could be generated by covering California's aqueducts in solar panels. And think about the evaporation losses that you could potentially avoid by covering solar panels. That would save a lot of water, and we have the most energy intensive water in the country, so saving water saves energy in the state. So again, another big win-win scenario that I think we need to get more support behind. And these are what are called flotovoltaics. It's when you basically put solar panels on pontoons, and there's issues with the lake effect here, I think, too. That we, that, so I don't want to be too strong of an advocate for this until we see better science on it. But the general idea is you could put these over, you know, uh, wastewater ponds, for example. You could put these at a wastewater treatment facility. You could put these, I've seen these integrated with aquaculture in China. So if they got all these seashell aquaculture going down in, in, the, in the water column, and they put these solar panels on top of them, provides more uh, shade, makes the water cooler, sometimes makes the, the, high, the aquaculture work a little better. But we need more science, and there's not been much on that. But these are all better ideas than what the first, genera first wave of solar projects that all had ha major habitat impacts. And I, I would say that, I, you know, if we were to say, how many projects are really bad in California? How many projects had big environmental impacts? Probably talking on the order of a couple dozen that had, you know, major impacts that, that could have been avoided. So this isn't a major issue. And, and like I said, the last few years, the, the new issue is not building necessarily on lands that are high quality habitat, but how to build on these lands that are slightly degraded but still important habitat for like the kit fox and things like that. So anyhow, that's my story of, of the green civil war. It's really not a civil war, right? We have an opportunity to find win-win scenarios here and, and couple our energy systems with other kinds of productive systems and, and I think that that would bring us to a much more sustainable vision of a solar industry. So thank you very much. I will have... Uh, I have copies of my book in the car. I'll bring them out if anybody's interested in that. Okay, let's give our Thank speaker you. a hand. Uh, and then, so raise your hand up, and I will try to keep track of the order. If too many go up at once, I have to uh, decide what to do. So remember, keep it to a question, not a comment. Uh, I just, just quickly, this is going to be a, a model you can think of. It's like when you take a pair of pants and pull all the pockets out and the dirt and <laughs> coins and everything fills out. So the next thing that comes in mind is this is a fantastic, great soap opera. All right, I'll let you go. Okay, all right. Great, thanks very much for this. I'd like to get you a copy of your presentation. I, sure. I think we sent you through Alex. We sent you... Uh, open letter to the Green New Deal people, oh. Scott. The, it's all very interesting and good that you're thinking about all this, and environmentally especially. The problem is that the, the predicate is that solar PV is good. Now, as an engineer and a stockholder in a PV manufacturer, mm -hmm. I can tell you it's not. And the reason it's not is because it's not a fully engineered product yet. It's not regulated, and so as a result, every one of those panels that's out there is wasting 80% of the sunlight as heat. And worse, as infrared, which re-excites greenhouse gas molecules above in the air. Right. So the problem with PV today is it's not something we should be, I'll try, we should be using without really looking at the science and engineering. And that's the problem. It becomes like a cult. People want to, oh, solar, we're going to have solar. What do you think about ethanol? I don't think about burning anything. <laughs> that, that's the whole point. But, but we have to, I mean, we, have, we need energy sources from somewhere. And we think, I mean, e think about ethanol. 
Ethanol, ethanol is wasting 99% of that energy as heat because it's only collecting 1% and turning it into biofuels. Okay, please stop talking now. The reality is California already okay. has 10% of all its power, 24-7. Okay, you need to mic from the Diablo and pick it up. For, I mean, please from, stop. From Diablo Canyon, nuclear plant. New Jersey, Illinois, all these other states with nuclear plants. That's the solution because it doesn't take up a, a square mile for a megawatt, right? What we have never seen a very good, there's no good studies of the supply chain for nuclear power that actually demonstrates that its land use is That's lower. Department of Energy, if you look in the Find me a citation. Area, I'd love to see it. Please stop responding to his questions, otherwise he'll keep going. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> Dis discuss it afterwards, I think, is probably the best. Uh, so at any rate, thanks very much for, your, uh, for the talk. It's very thought-provoking. Um, I'm involved. I'm, I'm involved. Uh, I'm involved with um, San Jose Clean Energy, and one of the things we're very concerned about is, is storage opportunities. So I wondered if you guys look at non-battery storage um, options. I, I haven't, I mean, thinking about it, I have no specific projects on, like non-wires -wire, alternatives are, are critical. I think there's a, I think the big debate happening right now is whether we need to have a better interconnected grid so we can wheel power from Wyoming or from Washington or Arizona to here, or whether we're going to need more non-wires alternatives, meaning more storage um, on this side, whether that's hydrogen or that's batteries or pump storage or, or something. And one of the things about when Diablo Canyon retires, one of the reasons that I, I'm okay with Diablo Canyon retiring is it requires a backup system. And it's a, a 1.2 gigawatt hydropower plant that needs to be sitting there idle all the time. And that's a pump storage project. So if you shut down Diablo Canyon, you can suddenly start using that to actually store some of that excess curtailed. Currently, I'm, the, the system's not designed very good right now at all. We're paying Arizona to consume our electricity when we overgenerate it in the middle of the day. After we're, we've already paid for a premium for that, that money, uh, for that, that kilowatt hour. So we have some major design challenges. I have problems with the big grid vision because more transmission creates more sparks. Right? We see wildfires. Where are you going to get a, you're having a hard time getting a solar project sighted. Try to get a transmission line sighted. That's a major, major challenge. So I think we're going to have to start thinking about more non-wires alternatives and how to get that cheaper. And that's going to require a lot of innovations, I think. That's where we're going to see you know, smart charging technologies for cars to take that power kind of when it's available. Um, home batteries. I mean, people talk about batteries being expensive. You know what's expensive for a home? You know what's expensive? A home in California. A battery is not anywhere near, I mean, it's a, people are choosing between battery and solar panels and granite countertops. They're not choosing between technologies. So I think that that's an important part of this story. Alex here is a local expert on the molten salt thorium reactors. Uh -huh. Now these reactors operate at atmospheric pressure. They do not need cooling water. They could be, they don't have to rely on oceans, lakes, or rivers for cooling. They could be located anywhere. Well, my, my, pit, my, when I respond, my students tell me stuff that sounds so great, I say, if they're so great, how come I don't see more of it? Because the Chinese are doing it now, that's why well, it's so great. I, so I'm not afraid of it. I want to see it economically viable. I don't see any. I don't see any economically viable pathway for any nuclear power. You really don't. No. Really. So you don't know why the DOE lists it as the least, least environmentally for that. I mean, I don't get it. Yeah, but he keeps making assertions that are false. And I know they're false. <laughs> that sounds yeah, great. Yeah, but you guys are listening to him. <laughs> That's the problem. <laughs> okay. The thing that's uh, buggy, it's been bugging me about uh, solar panel, uh, solar and wind, is they produce electricity only a small percentage of the time. Solar doesn't produce electricity at night, mm -hmm. and during the daytime, it's erratic. Every time a cloud goes by or, or anything, so it forces us to use backup most of the time. And from for everything I've learned, the backup is almost always uh, fossil fuels. 
And uh, California, it's a lot of ga natural gas. So I'm, at the moment, I am not sold on solar or wind. We, we've had days in California where we've had down to 8% of our electricity coming from carbon sources. Diablo Canyon, wind power, that's just turn, during parts of the day. But, you know, I've been, here, I've been doing this for you know, not very long, you know, 12 years, and every, sin, every single increment I hear, oh, we're going to, can't have that much solar, it's going to make the grid collapse. We're going to start having blackouts. I haven't seen any of that happen. So, it, and, and it's cheaper. I mean, when you're talking about having to burn less natural gas because it's only backup and you're not using it as your primary, I mean, you have a lot of benefits to that. Okay, we have four more minutes. You must keep the questions short, the comments short. There are groups that have an acronym that means yes in our neighborhood. <laughs> Oh, I'm being censored now? <laughs> <laughs> you said that it was a lot more expensive to put solar panels above parking lots than out in the desert. I'm wondering what the cost uh, is involved there. What, why is that expensive? Usually because it's they're smaller and there's more when like the, the blueprint creation you had to deal with different like the owner of the building you have to the, of the parking storage, you have to okay. construction <laughs> permits. There's just a lot of like little. <laughs> there's no cookie cutter approach. Whereas the big power plants, they they've got a cookie cutter approach. They know how to just create a big blank template and drop it all down. Every parking structure is different. Requires and then there's cost of steel and all that that to hold the infrastructure together. So they're mainly balance the system and permitting cost differences. Okay, I have a comment about what you said before that's incorrect. Diablo Canyon and the Helms Pump Storage Plant. The Helms Pump Storage Plant is not used by PG&E the way it was originally intended to be used. It's been used to waste energy because if you pump and generate at the same time, mm -hmm. you can actually waste energy, and they waste energy coming from the excess of solar that we have in California during the middle of the day. So the Helms project is actually used to waste energy even when we're paying other states, as you mentioned, to take our excess solar. You don't sound like you're getting it short. So. Mm. I have one more thing. Diablo Canyon operates 24-7 since 1986, and it can be asked by Cal ISO, as it has been periodically over the years, to not stop generating for maintenance purposes and keep running beyond its normal schedule because nuclear power. Yeah. We've already had them. I I hear you. I've been in Diablo Canyon. I've taken a tour of that thing. And the marine biologist also that told me it's the biggest source of marine wildlife mortality on the Pacific Coast. Okay. Hi, Dana St. George. Hi, I'd just like to say we um, put solar panels on our roof about 10 years ago, mm -hmm. and we have an electric car, and it's such a wonderful feeling. I have not been to a gas station in over four years, mm -hmm. and I can't understand why anyone would want to drive a gas car. And it's just so easy. I just plug it into a regular outlet in my driveway and at night, whatever, and occasionally, not very always. And I come out in the morning and my car is 100% charged mm -hmm. at a very low level, you know. And, and it's just so wonderful to be free of having to go to those smelly gas stations. <laughs> With the power tower technology, um, you, you say that presently, or at least in the past, they've just aimed the panels at an area above and created a death zone. Why not just aim the panels in various directions and not create a death zone? Seems like it's just a software problem. Take take an hour to solve. I think that, that's a great question. I don't know if they've... I'm not sure what they've explored there. I mean, the I, folks earlier had discussed maybe trying to make the mirrors flip inside out, but that would obviously be difficult because <laughs> you, you, be, you need a big gap in the bottom to make them flip upside down. But not clear. The, the, we're never going to see another CSP in California. 